Hi everyone, welcome to our talk, a guide to centering student feedback as the driver of creative learning with emerging technology. We are really excited to talk with you about gathering student feedback today. So we're gonna dive right in because we have a lot of information. So first off, a quick introduction. My name is Lisa Castaneda. I am the co-founder and CEO of Foundry 10, which is the organization that's presenting this research today. I'm here with my two colleagues, Sam Binman, who is a senior researcher at Foundry 10, as well as our director of research, and Rivdi Devanji, who is an associate researcher here. So just really quickly, who is Foundry 10? On this next slide here, we can see that Foundry 10 is actually an educational research organization. We have a philanthropic focus, so everything we do is free to schools and free to the organizations we work with. You can see some photographs here of some of the different areas in which we work. Um, but our big thing is that we want to expand ideas about how people learn and create direct value for youth. And emerging technologies are a really interesting way to do that. Please check out our website if you have a chance, because you'll be able to see some of our research, our programs, and our philanthropic work. So let's talk a little bit about where we're going to be going today. We're talking about emerging technology. So that could be anything from like virtual reality to augmented reality, all the way down to just, you know, advanced things you might be using in software in your classroom settings. We know that this type of technology is really pitched by manufacturers to educators. And our own research, as well as many other pieces of research, has shown that it can be engaging with interesting applications for our students. However, it's really important to remember that these are all still technological tools, and we really need to have a thoughtful approach when bringing them in. Our students themselves are a super important source of feedback and input on this technology, and sometimes we accidentally overlook their feedback and input, which is actually a mistake on our part because what they have to say is really important. Today, we're going to be focusing on gathering and responding to student input. So I want to give a few slides here just to help set the tone for why this is all important. So moving on. This is a more timely topic than ever. Unless you've been living under a rock, the metaverse is all over the place. Everyone's talking about the implications of it, whether or not it's bad, whether or not it's going to be useful, and how it's going to impact students, parents, and educators. Additionally, we have the whole impact of the pandemic itself and how that has changed fundamentally how we're thinking about educational technology in school settings and how our students interact with it. So as these things are coming together amidst everything else that's happening in our world, we need to continue to ensure that value is actually created for our learners with the technology we're bringing in, not just through our assessments, but through conversation and engaging with our students and gathering their feedback. Moving on to the next slide. We also know that technology itself comes at a cost whether or not that's an actual monetary cost, whether or not it's a time investment cost, you know, finding the right content, taking time to think about how it's going to incorporate, be incorporated into the curriculum. You know, research shows us that there's all sorts of neat examples of how teachers are innovating and bringing technology in. However, there is less evidence that this is always coming at some sort of uh, value creation piece for our actual students. Like, is it actually improving student learning? Some of our own research with teachers has actually shown that schools are a really great place to bring in these emerging technologies because oftentimes students don't have access to these technologies outside of a school setting. But again, just because we can bring them there doesn't necessarily mean that students are leaving with what we're hoping that they are or that they're even having the type of experience that we hope that they would have. The next slide can come on up here. We also know that tech integration is not always easy. Technology can be difficult to incorporate into the classroom. And this slide just talks about how, yes, we see this sort of ideal, like if you bring this in, this is what it will look like. But we know that actual classrooms with actual students come up with all sorts of other ways for things to not translate as cleanly as we hoped. And as we're bringing that technology in, we're also having to shift our pedagogy, shift our approach to teaching. One of our studies really showed the extent to which teachers go to really make sure that they're setting you know, their students up for success with this technology. But again, that focus can often be just on bringing it in and getting it going. And what we're gonna be talking about today is that back end piece of after you've done it, what are, what are students saying? What are they taking away? So moving on to the, the next slide here, what we're going to be going into today with Sam and Rivdi is gathering that feedback. It's 
critical that we do this. So we're not just getting the assessment of actual student learning, but is it having the impact that we're hoping in terms of how students are processing and thinking about the information? It's relatively simple to gather useful student feedback, but there's definitely tips and tricks that can help you. And today we're gonna to share some research and tools that will help. So I'm gonna go ahead and kick it over to Sam for the next. Yeah, so we wanted to share some of our research findings and some of the themes that we've heard from students when we've asked for their feedback about technology in the classroom. Just to give you a little bit of an overview, um, the main place that Foundry 10 has done research has been uh, applied research on virtual reality implementation in the classroom. So we've interviewed about 40 teachers or more and then surveyed thousands of students as they use VR in their classroom. And we find virtual reality to be a really interesting space for this type of work because um, according to the research, we know that there's a lot of potential for virtual reality in learning. And then we know that it really depends on what types of virtual reality experiences are used and how they're implemented in the classroom. So one of the ways that uh, we like to ask for student feedback is to help us and to help educators distinguish between how much students are enjoying using a new technology or just that excitement and that engagement, as opposed to the actual value that it brings for their learning. So uh, here you can see from one of our research projects, we saw that, yeah, the majority of students, um, about 80%, said that they did enjoy using virtual reality in the classroom. And then there was this sort of concerning, you know, maybe 20% of students who didn't enjoy it as much. So that's definitely something that we would want to learn more about. And then we also asked a question in contrast about how valuable it was for those students to use virtual reality to learn in class. And again, um, it was a majority of students, maybe a little fewer, 73% um, responded that they found it to be valuable for their learning. And so again, you would want to kind of delve more into why it was that there was a group of students who didn't find it as valuable for their learning. And then another way that we've asked students um, to learn more about value for learning is to ask them to compare the emerging technology such as virtual reality to their other regular classroom activities. So in this case, we saw um, about a third of students said it was more valuable compared to their regular activities. About half of the students said it was about the same, which is really interesting because it takes a lot of resources to make this happen. Um, and it's an investment of time and energy. And then about 18% said it was less valuable. So that's a small proportion of students, but it's still concerning and still something to investigate further. And then lastly, uh, we delved a little bit more into that question about value for learning by asking students, um, whether the virtual reality allowed them to do things they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. So we know through theory and uh, research work on virtual reality that it does, there's a lot of possibilities. It allows students to try things like a flight simulator that might be dangerous in real life, or um, it allows them to take a virtual field trip to a place that would just be too expensive. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities there. And students tended to agree. Um, here it was again the majority of students who agreed that the tool allowed them to do things that they couldn't otherwise do. But before we move on, I wanted to say two things. Um, one is that, as you saw in this section, we used a lot of rating scales, and maybe that left you wanting to know more about why students were answering the way they did. And so um, in a moment, Rindy will share with you some other uh, question types such as open-ended questions, where you can understand a little bit more of students' reason for responding the way that they did. And then um, you might have also noticed another trend, which is that in each of these questions, there was a segment of students, maybe 20 or 30 percent, who weren't as on board with enjoying virtual reality or finding value for their learning. And so that's really important. And um, that's an example of a place where you have some growth and some real value in asking for student feedback so that you can make improvements next time around. Um, I have some information here about some of the themes in the reasons that students gave for answering the way they did. So students said that um, using virtual reality in the classroom was interactive and engaging. It helped their understanding of concepts and also allowed them to practice in what felt like a real world setting or a scenario. 
And then students who disagreed about um, using virtual reality and its value for their learning cited reasons like feeling uncomfortable, maybe through nausea or maybe the headset was uncomfortable. Um, or sometimes the virtual environment has a lot going on and you're not really sure where to focus your attention or some students even find that stressful sometimes. And other, other times students just prefer other learning mediums or activities. And then finally, um, asking for student feedback can help us understand the mechanisms behind their learning. So in one case or one example, we learned that students found the visual and the interactive elements of virtual reality help them to remember information. So here we've got a few quotes from the students in our research, and I'll just give you a moment to read over those. Okay, we can move on to, to Ridley's section. Lisa was able to provide some context and additional research into why it's important to collect student feedback when we're implementing newer and emerging technologies into the classroom. Sam was able to provide some examples from our research of when we've actually gone ahead and collected that student feedback and the types of responses students were able to give us about the technologies being used by their teachers. From all of that work, we've been able to compile a guide for other educators who are interested in assessing the value of the educational technologies that they're bringing to the classroom using student feedback. And we hope to share that as a resource with all of you today here at CLS. The goal of the guide is to help students, help teachers assess the value of the technology and ground their technological decision making in student feedback and make the process of collecting that student feedback an easy one. Our guide covers the key steps for gathering feedback by going through the first step, which is deciding what you want to know, how to go about collecting what it is that you want to know, and then how to interpret and apply the feedback from students into your classroom practice. So in that, in the key steps for gathering student feedback, the first is deciding what it is that you want to be able to know from students. The second is asking the questions in a way that will get your their honest responses. And the last is making a plan of what you will be able to do with that feedback. In that first step, deciding what you wanna know, it's important to be specific about this, the aspects of the technology or its uses that you're interested in getting feedback on. When we've done this in our work, in our research, and when we have observed other teachers do this, we've found that the types of questions fall into four main categories. The first is the relative value of the technology. And this is when teachers are asking whether or not this was the best medium to teach or explore this specific concept, or whether students would have preferred to le learn this through a different medium, whether an analog medium or even a di another digital medium, Sometimes they would have preferred it because it's more comfortable or because it's something that they're familiar with, or they just didn't see that the emerging technology added more value. It could have just been like doing another worksheet, but now you're doing it online. And collecting that type of feedback can help you know whether that was the right implementation of that technology. The second category is joy in learning. And this one tends to get overlooked because we're so focused sometimes on learning objectives and making sure that the tools and methods that we're using are helping students hit those learning objectives. But in all of that, did students have fun learning? Did they feel engaged with the material? Did it enhance their curiosity? And all of those things play a huge role in value. Um, and so asking about joy can provide some really interesting input and feedback from students like we saw in our pie chart from when Sam was presenting. Um, the third category is our learning objectives. Did students actually hit those? Did they feel like they could hit those with the emerging technologies that we're introducing in the classroom? And a side note here is that in our research, we have found that sometimes when introducing a newer technology into the classroom, this step gets overlooked. Um, teachers are so excited to implement something like VR that they don't always make it clear to students why VR is being used to teach this specific concept or explore this idea. And when students don't know what to look out for when they're um, using a technology or experiencing something in virtual reality, then it can be easy to be overwhelmed or get lost by all the other things that there are to interact with that they kind of miss the point of why you put them in there. 
Something that we've seen help with this is one, either introducing all of those things before students use the technology or go into a virtual reality experience. And the second thing is having a debrief to make sure that um, you're on the same page about what was meant to be experienced or meant to be learned. And then maybe you're even capturing some of those other things that students explored or learned that you weren't even intending, but are useful. And I guess the byproduct of that is also seeing that things that maybe they interacted with or explored that were just kind of a waste of time, didn't really add value to their learning, but maybe added fun. Just a, a set of questions to help understand that would be helpful for educators. And the final, it, final one is the improvements. What could have been done differently, either with the way the lesson was pre presented or the way the technology used, was used in that lesson um, that could have led to a le better learning experience. And when we have asked these type of questions, we've gotten some really honest and interesting feedback from students, even though it seems like a very broad and general category of feedback. Um, it, has, it has provided for good, honest feedback from students, which has been helpful in our practice as researchers. Finally, um, it's interesting to think about the different methods for gathering this feedback because we're not trying to add an additional task to either teachers' lists or students' lists. Um, in our research, we've seen teachers approach gathering feedback by setting aside a specific amount of time to get feedback from their students or by adding it onto a unit exam or homework, something that students are already doing. And this just means that you're not getting feedback from the extremes, that students who had a really good experience or really bad experience are the more likely ones to provide feedback, but you want to be able to get a general sense across your classroom of how students were experiencing the technology. And so um, by incorporating into your daily practice or some other things that they're already doing, you'll get, uh, you're more likely to get responses from everyone. It's also important to be specific about the activity or the type of technology tool that you're using um, that you're asking for feedback on because we probably use a lot of different types of technologies when teaching um, every day that if you're asking very general questions, you might not be able to understand which ones students are providing feedback on. And this will just enhance the quality of your feedback. And finally, it's really, really important to encourage students to provide feedback by discussing its purpose and importance. And this just enables students to feel like agents of change or agents uh, in, within their own learning process that they can see that they are providing feedback and that's gonna be used in informing your practice as the teacher. And um, this can just make things more collaborative and enhance the quality of the feedback that you're getting. So what are some methods for actually collecting this feedback? I think in Sam's slides, you were able to see what it looks like when you collect Likert scale responses or scaled responses that ask students to rate an experience from one to something. Um, and this gives you a good snapshot of how students are feeling. But as Sam said, it's important to follow those up um, if you'd like to with some open-ended responses that allow you to understand why students picked those responses. Um, along with these two, there's also group discussions which allow you to just gauge, uh, a, do a quick temperature check of how um, your students are feeling. And then multiple choice responses are a little bit more forced in terms of the way they collect feedback. But um, if you, there are sp specific main ideas that you're hoping to target, these can be a really effective way of just getting those quick uh, responses and ideas from your students. Then comes the step of actually interpreting all of that feedback that you've collected from your students. The more restricted and formatted types of res, uh, response types will allow you to tally the different types of responses, like for example, the Likert scale or multiple choice and come to an average to be able to understand the average sentiment in your class. And that's really important. But as we saw in our pie charts, that the average is very informative, but it's really important to check out the outliers because we did have a number of them. We had about 20% of outliers if you went through all of the, um, all of the scales. And they can provide you with a much more nuanced understanding of what's going on in your classroom and how students are feeling. Um, that can be the same for the interpreting the open-ended responses, which once again, you can look at general themes and categorize different responses to get kind of an average sentiment of your students. But once again, it's important to look out for those salient examples or salient um, responses that students are providing. And we get that in our research all the time. Some of the quotes that we put on our slides came from the more salient responses. It didn't necessarily mean that everyone felt that way, but one or two students felt that way and it informed our practice as researchers. So we included it. Having a rubric ready to note down the or tally the different comments is something that we've seen teachers do 
when they're collecting feedback on the fly from their students. And that's been a really helpful tool for them. Finally, once you have collected and done this type of analysis on the feedback that students have given you, it's really important to share it back with them. Maybe interpret those sentiments with them. And all of this, once again, is just part of making them feel like agents within their own classroom and helping you inform you and all of you in your uses of technology in the classroom. And overall, the goal is to just help collect that feedback and help it inform your practice in the future. If you're interested in learning more about our research on this, the different things that teachers have shared with us or the different ways other teachers have gone about collecting feedback from their students, you can check out our other publications and white papers on our website, as well as our Medium blog. And we're also very active on social media. So thank you for coming to our talk.